so hi good afternoon I, i'm sue lewis and i welcome everyone to this webinar on longevity and pensions over the next hour and a half we're going to be exploring if our pension system is fit for purpose and what needs to happen to make it sustainable for all this is the third ILC event with the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries exploring the impact of longevity on the considerable pensions challenges we face. We're grateful to the IFOA for making the series possible and I should mention at this point that I'm a lay member of the IFOA's regulatory board. I've worked a little bit on pensions policy over the years and I've been a master trust trustee some issues are dear to my heart, communication, the gender pensions gap, which DWP has just uh, announced stands at 35% and the self-employed. But the main reason I'm here is that I'm about to start as one of the ILC's new trustees, which I'm really looking forward to next month. So I'm delighted by this opportunity to learn from our great panel of speakers. Following their thoughts, there'll be time for Q&A and thank you to those who've submitted questions in advance. You can also post thoughts and questions on Twitter using hashtag pensions. And we've got live captions, so click on the live button on your screen if you would like to enable these. Finally, just a reminder, the session is being recorded. So without more ado, can I invite John Cridland to open the discussion. Uh, John has many strings to his bow, but he's currently, currently the chairman of the Home Group Housing Trust. John's particular expertise is that from 2016 to 17, he led the UK's first state pension age review. So over to you, John, thank you. And a reminder to all speakers, you've got five to seven minutes each. So a lot of material to get into um, a very short time. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sue, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining this important event. Um, as Sue said, in 2016, I was asked by Ros Altman, then the pensions minister, to address three critical questions arising from the emerging impact of the ageing society. The first was how we can afford to live a longer pensionable life. The second is how we can work longer where this is necessary in order to fund those pensions. And the third is how we can help those who can't work longer for reasons of health or other factors. There's a balance here, isn't there, to be struck between access to pensions, which is a basic human right, and the affordability of pensions, which is clearly a concern for the Treasury, but actually is a concern for all of us because as taxpayers, the current generation of taxpayers is paying for the current generation of pensioners. And in that balance, I concluded in 2017 that the state pension age should rise from 67 to 68 by 2039, instead of what the government had planned at the time, which would have been 2046. So I brought it forward by seven years. And I did that in order to save the exchequer, the taxpayer and the country, 0.4% of GDP, not therefore being spent on the state pension because of people having to wait a little bit longer for it. Why was that important? And why did I conclude that was the right thing to do? Because with no change, by 2066, 67, we'll be spending more than 7% of GDP on pensions. When I reported five years ago, we were spending just over 5%. And I don't think the country, never mind the government, had any particular plan for 50 years hence of where we would find that extra 2% of GDP. There were many other factors of the ageing society, which was also increasing the amount of GDP that would be spent health being the other big one. And in, in total, it was more than 6% of GDP that had to be found with no obvious evidence where it was going to come from. But I also concluded that increasing the state pension age, as we're already seeing, is putting a lot of stress on those that are most disadvantaged in our society and least able to work longer. 
And I concluded that we needed a redefinition of job roles for older workers. And I'll generalize here, Sue, in the interest of time, it's a complex subject, but with mm. a focus on knowledge and experience rather than physical and mental contributions. Let's look at what older workers know and can contribute back to younger workers rather than expecting a 68 year old nurse to work on A&E at midnight on the Saturday, uh, on a Saturday, a busy Saturday. Um, and we could do that by focusing on something which the government has picked up to some degree, which was my notion of a midlife MOT, where we actually look at what we're likely to need to do in the next stage, the third stage of our life, and make sure we make the right life choices and the right financial choices. But that would still leave some people unable to work, either because of health or poor education, poor employability, or something that really so struck me, that many of us in our 60s in the future are actually going to be carers looking after aged parents and other relatives or partners, sometimes in their 90s. And that was going to become normative in the way that it was for many working mums and some working dads to have to do childcare at the same time as working. How were we going to deal with the fact that the society needed us to provide informal childcare? So there were challenges and the balance I came to was bringing the state pension age to 68 in 2039. But I concluded with a focus on those who were most disadvantaged that it shouldn't go any higher. There were those who wanted the state pension age to start with a seven. There were those who wanted it to reach 68 at an earlier age driven by the financial impact. I concluded that wasn't reasonable. I also concluded that the state pension age should not in future increase by more than one year in a decade. So if we needed it to increase because of the blessing of increased longevity, there was a steady impact, not a cliff edge. It was already clear when I reported in 2017 that longevity improvements were slowing. It wasn't clear at that time how much they were slowing. Because of this, as I've said, I didn't see a case for more aggressive increases in the state pension age. What has happened since, and my uh, good colleague Baroness Neville Rolf has just done the second of the reviews, and she's got much more evidence as we now know that that slowing started about uh, a decade ago. And actually in the second part of the last decade, between 2014 and 2019 in particular, it, the, the improvements in longevity almost stalled. We then had the pandemic where we actually went backwards on longevity, and I'm sure Owen will talk more about this, so I won't. But I think my key conclusion is because of the impact of the pandemic, we still don't really know what is happening. How much of that was a spot source issue, the pandemic, dreadful as it was, and its impact on mortality? How much of it was the underlying trend, which was already slowing, but not clear why and not clear how long. So I think the government was probably right when Baroness Neville Rolfe reported to say, we've heard from Master Cridland in 2017, we've heard from the learned Baroness in 2023, we've still got some time on our hands before we make a final decision on this, let's pause. I certainly don't think there's a case, even with the pressure on public <laughs> finance, which has got worse, for more aggressively increasing the state pension age. I stand by the balance I came up with in 2017. There might be a case for going more slowly, but let's see what the demographic evidence is. We've got time on our hands. And clearly, if we do need to make changes, we need to focus on the fact that there is an average, there are typical people, but there are also untypical, those who are the most affected. What we do know though, is we can't do nothing. As Baroness Neville Rolf recently reported, and I'll close Sue on this point, uh, today we have 1.7 million people with the blessing of being alive over the age of 85. By In 50 years time, that number will have gone up 3 million to 4.7 million. Most of the consequences that we're now having to face of an aging society are already baked into the cake. Mm -hmm. Even if longevity has peaked, even if that bell curve is hitting the top, we still need to cope with the implications. And that's why that complex balance, the intergenerational fairness of the funding implications for those in work with the accessibility to pensions for those who need pensions and are of a certain age, is always going to be complex. And it does, I think, mean the blessing of longer living 
means longer working. Thank you very much indeed. No, th thank you, John, for packing so, so many thoughts into such a short time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a reminder that uh, questions, uh, we won't take questions at the end of each speaker, but if you want to put them into the Q&A, then we'll wrap them up at the end. So thanks again, John. And if I could now invite Leah Evans, who is chair of the IFOA Pensions Board, to talk about the IFOA's work on pensions. Leah's, uh, Leah's day job is a, as a partner at uh, EY. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, Sue. Um, so yeah, I am here today in my capacity as chair of the IFOA's uh, Pensions Board. Um, and it is something, uh, you know, this topic is something that the IFOA has done quite a lot of work on. In addition to education professional standards, the IFOA is actively engaged in research and thought leadership and policy debates and pensions and the, the adequacy and sustainability of pensions is, is, is clearly a key topic for the IFOA. So with that said, what I'd like to talk about today is, is how we consider longevity as part of this debate around pensions policy and sustainability. And obviously, if you think of pensions, longevity is clearly one of the very key factors in this. So, you know, from a cost perspective, how long does a pension need to be paid for? How much do we need to contribute or reserve? Um, and then from an individual perspective, the key question that a lot of people worry about is, will I run out of money before I die? Or some people also think about, you know, is my pension providing me good value if I don't live as long as expected? Um, now, John's talked quite a bit already about the state pension. Um, and as you will all know, in the UK, the overall pension system is made up of, of different layers and longevity impacts them in different ways. So in particular, what we've got is a combination of public and private provision. And the public provision is really intended to provide a sort of basic safety net minimum level of, of, of provision, you know, combined with, with the, the rest of the benefit system. And if people want a more comfortable retirement, it's really the additional private or personal pension that they will be relying on. And that's, that's how the system is designed and that's the basis on which we pay national insurance contributions. So private pension provision is a really important uh, part of the overall system. Um, from a public policy perspective, there are therefore two questions. First, there's the cost of the state pension. Uh, which John has already covered to some extent, and I'm sure Owen will talk about as well. So I won't go into that much detail. Um, but secondly, the, the cost and the sustainability and the affordability of the private system is really important because it's such a big part of it. Um, and as our population ages, as John has outlined, more people reach retirement, it would have big implications on the wider economy as well as public services if an increasing pop proportion of the population has little or no disposable income and <laughs> is struggling to make ends meet. So let's talk about the private sector system then. So historically, the UK has had a fairly uh, had a system whereby uh, many people received fairly generous uh, DB defined benefits. Uh, pensions and together with a state pension that provided uh, a good level of retirement income. And as you will all know, we've seen a significant shift away from that. Demographic changes and in particular increasing life expectancy are one key factor to this, which has driven up the cost to employers of providing this pension. But other factors are low interest rates, changing in funding rules to provide greater member security and so on. Um, but the, the result is that most sponsors have closed their DB schemes and most people now, if they are working, will receive or, or will be saving into a DC pension if they work in the private sector. So, you know, for example, I'll be 42 next week. I've been working for 20 years. I don't have any DB pension or my pension is DC. But, you know, my colleagues who might be 10, 15 years older than me, they will probably have a mix of DB and DC. Um, and what this means is that we're only really going to be seeing the impact of this shift from DB to DC in the next, you know, 15, 20 years or so, because at the moment, many people who are retiring still have a mix of, of pension. Now, 
as you'll also probably all know, the big challenge with DC is, is, is adequacy. Most people don't save anywhere near as much into their DC pension as they need to if they wanted to provide the sort of retirement income that they would like to. Um, most employers don't provide that level of contribution, partly because they spent so much money on DB um, in the past. Um, but, you know, in practice, most people can't afford to pay more contributions than they currently are. Um, in many cases, they're well aware that they're falling short, but they just, you know, if, if, if it's a choice of eating now or eating in the future, um, they, they have to provide a prioritised current income. And the FOA has done some, some research on this. So working with the PLSA's um, retirement living standards, uh, the, the sort of current auto-enrolment um, rates, uh, combined with the state pension are probably enough to target a sort of minimum level of retirement if you wanted to aim for what the PLSA describes as a moderate retirement you probably need to save about a quarter of your income for a sort of average earner and more than double that if you really want a comfortable retirement so the the the, the gulf between what people are saving what they would need to save is 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 quite big and you know I'm not telling you anything new there um but what uh, the, the other big consideration for DC that we're not really seeing the impact of yet is this shift um, and the change in terms of uncertainty and risk. And again, this is something that the IFA has done a lot of work on as part of our great risk transfer campaign, which focuses on the shift of risk from organizations to, to individuals and for DC pensions in particular. You know, we talk quite a bit about investment risk and, and people facing that, but longevity risk is, is probably one of the key risks for individuals in, in, in DC pension schemes. Um, and it's one that's very difficult to manage as an individual. Um, so, you know, again, if I take myself as an example, I have a decent income and I'm and actually I can work out how much money I would need to save in order to get uh, the right sort of pension, you know, whether I can afford to or not, is a quite, it's another matter that I could work it out, but I would base it on my expect my, my life expectancy. But you know, what do I do if I take after my great aunt who uh, lived till she was 101? I won't have planned for that. And what do I do for those later years in retirement? Um, and how can I protect myself? And, and the reality is that at the moment, that's quite difficult. I could purchase an individual annuity, um, but there's a question over whether I perceive that to be good value. And also, when do I do that? And how do I find that balance? So it's, it's, it's really difficult. Um, but what I'm pleased with is that there is um, now lots of debate and research into, into this area, both from the IFOA as well as lots of other industry bodies and, 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 and other companies. Um, and it's this focus on what we might call the decumulation phase of retirement and how do we actually best manage and provide time income through a combination of sources, which might be a combination of drawdown, individual annuities, perhaps different types of insurance, sort of, you know, almost like tail risk insurance um, or different types of pension provision, which might include longevity pooling. Um, CDC is one example, but there's different variations that are, that, that are being looked at. And some of these ideas are really interesting and, and I think will be the key to making the, the, the pension system work better in future. Um, and the key challenge that I see there is making it work for individuals and making it work in a way that individuals understand. Um, so I just want to finish by closing the loop on, on why sorting out this the, the private sector pension is such a big public policy question and why it should be a really important priority for the government. Um, and as I say, if, if we end up in a situation where people can't retire, that's a lot of money lost from the, 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 the economy. But it also just, um, I think the premise on which the pension system was built doesn't necessarily quite hold anymore. And in particular, this idea that you don't need as much income in retirement, for example, that is sort of based on the assumption that many people will have paid off their mortgages by the time they retire. Whereas, you know, younger generations may well reach retirement without ever being able to buy a house or paying off their mortgage, they will need much more income to cover housing costs as well as higher living costs. Um, and then as people live longer, 
they will need care potentially and who pays for that. Um, and then finally, um, you know, as John said, there's also a balance about a question of balance about quality of life, um, inequality of different people. And I think there's a question for us as a society over what sort of quality of life should we reasonably be able to expect if we are all living longer and, and how do we ultimately fund that? Great, thank you very much, Leah. Again, a lot of food for thought there. Um, and particularly, I like the point about communications and people understanding, because I just think that is so vital. Uh, so next up, we've got Owen Dimbilo, who heads up the Public Service Pensions Policy Team at the Government Actuaries Department. Uh, I think, Owen, you're going to explain a little bit about the role of the GAD before talking about the pensions work you do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Sue. And, and that's right, yeah. So I'm going to say a few words about um, Government Actuary Department, so more commonly known as GAD's role advising government, and then some thoughts on the impact of an ageing population on the, the various public sector pension arrangements. Um, so GAD, just quickly, it's a non-ministerial department led by the Government Actuary, uh, Martin Clark. Uh, that provides actuary analysis, advice and support across the public sector. Um, so as you mentioned, Sue, I head up the team that, team that advises Treasury on the public service pensions policy. So there, there are 20 public service pension schemes, and this includes workers from uh, the NHS, teachers, uh, civil service, local government, firefighters, police, um, armed, force, armed forces, judiciary. Um, and it, counts for 15 million members in total across those schemes of active deferred pensioner um, and amounts to annual benefit payments approaching 50 billion. So these schemes are firstly vital in providing a large proportion of the population with a pension in retirement, um, but also represent a significant obligation on the taxpayer. Uh, now, for those who aren't aware, just quickly, the, these the, these public service pension schemes are not subject to the Pensions Act 2004 Part 3 kind of TPR based uh, regime, um, but instead are subject to the Public Service Pensions Act um, and Treasury policy. So my team's role is to support and advise Treasury on the policy, uh, but we're of course not the ultimate policy makers. Uh, we then have a separate team at GAD who advise the actual uh, public service pension schemes in a scheme actuary uh, capacity. Uh, GAD also advises central government on various other pension issues. Um, the most noteworthy for today um, are probably uh, the quinquennial review of the National Insurance Fund. Uh, so this is the fund that pays out the state pension as well as other benefits. Um, and our role in the state pension age um, review where we look at um, life expectancy projections. So as with the wider pensions landscape, demographic shifts such as an aging population have the potential to have a significant impact on the sustainability of these pension schemes. I, I think before we explore that, it's just worth setting out how these uh, schemes are, are financed. So, um, for the majority of the public service pension schemes, uh, the exception is the local government uh, pension scheme, but the, the majority of those schemes and the state pension payment arrangement, um, th th these are unfunded pay-as-you-go arrangements. Therefore, essentially, the contributions that are paid into the scheme in any given year with regards to active members are effectively used to meet the pensions payable to those in retirement. Um, with a balancing payment to meet any shortfall where required. Um, as an aside, notional assets are tracked um, for these schemes, um, but they are kind of um, paid into general government coffers rather than being ring fenced in any meaningful way. Um, so due to the, the kind of financing of these schemes, what, what, what impact does an aging population have? Well, um, at a very high level, um, any um, an aging population will result in an increased balancing payment being required um, to, to kind of top up any contribution income to meet the benefit outgo. And clearly that's going to negatively impact on the government expenditure available elsewhere. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, National Insurance Fund and some of the messages here um, are relatively similar um, to those that, that John provided. 
So here the, the relevant demographic tre trends are those at the population level. Uh, in GAD's latest quinquennial review of the National Insurance Funds in 2020, uh, reported that projected changes in the size and structure of the population mean that over the coming decades there, there will be a major increase in the number of state pension recipients relative to the working age population. And one way to measure this is the so-called dependency ratio. So the number of um, pensioners per, um, per, per 100 people of working age. Um, and that was projected to increase from around 27% currently to around 43% in 2085. It's so really quite a stark increase. And one of the things the Quinquennial Review looks at is um, if we want to maintain or, or produce balance between the amount of money that comes in via contributions and the uh, benefit payment out, um, then national insurance contributions would actually have to increase by nearly 12% uh, by uh, the 2080s in order to uh, achieve that balance. In the absence of any changes to uh, national insurance contributions and, and based on same benefit levels, et cetera, um, the position we're in is, is currently, um, at the time of the 2020 quinquennial review, uh, that the national insurance contributions are currently uh, slightly greater than benefit payments being paid out. Um, so that will soon reverse in, in the early 2030s. And then by 2043-44, the National Insurance Fund is actually projected um, to be uh, exhausted. So if these projected demographic trends do materialise, and there's, of course, a great amount of uncertainty here, um, and something will uh, need to change at some point in the future, uh, whether it is uh, the level of national insurance contributions, the state pension age, uh, the level of benefits, triple lock, or indeed uh, direct government funding. I'm just going to also say a few words about the public service pension scheme. So um, the demographic shifts are a little bit more nuanced here, um, given they depend on the size of the public sector workforce, and that may play out in slightly different ways for different workforces. So as an example here, if we've got a, a general ageing population, um, what might that mean for, say, the NHS pension scheme? Well, Actually, it might mean there's an increase in the need for healthcare sector workforce, which actually could see an increase in active members of the NHS pension scheme. So it might have a slightly different feel to it than the, the general population. Um, and of course, the, the public service workforce uh, will also sort of depend to a certain extent on the political decisions at the time. Um, another difference between public service pension schemes and the National Insurance Fund is public service pension schemes carry out kind of regular actuarial valuations just in the same way a private sector uh, funded pension scheme would, which set the employer contribution rates uh, to target the scheme being fully funded. Now, there are a couple of um, measures within the public service pension schemes uh, designed to help with sustainability with respect to longevity. Uh, the first Owen, is that, yeah. Could I ask you to finish up? Fairly quickly, that, yeah, that's fine. This is my last last point. Uh, I'll, right, I'll just thank you. make this. Um, so there's, there's two measures and um, public service pension schemes to help with longevity. The first is that the uh, normal pension age in some of the schemes uh, is linked to the state pension age. So an increase in state pension age due to um, increases in expected longevity will feed through to the public service pension schemes. Uh, and the second is a process uh, known as the cost control mechanism, which at a very high level uh, measures certain elements of cost and where those are changed by a certain level uh, requires benefits to change to get those costs back to target. So there are a couple of areas there already designed to help with uh, any longevity correction. Um, and yeah, I'll pass back to you, Sue. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Owen. Again, more, more food for thought. Um, I'm now going to pass on to Lily Parsi, who's uh, Head of Projects at the ILC. Um, and Lily will talk about some research the ILC has done, which I think will bring some numbers to some of the issues Leia was talking about earlier. Uh, I think, Leia, you're not quite Gen X, but, uh, but quite close to it. So, Lily, please. 
Thank you. Thanks. Um, and it's been great to hear from everyone. I should say, I, I imagine most people on the on the line will know, but but clearly sort of our angle is um, we come in as the UK specialist think tank on the impact of longevity on society. Um, and, you know, as John said, clearly the fact that we're living longer is a good thing in itself. But one of the core areas that we focus on is how we can make sure that we actually have an income to, to enjoy those extra years with. Um, and I'm going to give a very quick sort of more of a sort of case study exploration here of some work we did on um, Generation X uh, last year. Um, and, you know, why did we focus on Generation X? Um, I think, Leia, you sort of mentioned this a little bit already. We, we see it really as the kind of that generation on the cusp where we see that big change really from from predominantly or sort of mixed uh, defined benefit schemes to really a, an increase in DC. Um, but actually a generation that in many cases will potentially have missed out on the opportunities of automatic enrollment as well. Um, obviously there's been massive sort of economic changes during that time. Um, so with the with the recession now, obviously we, we have another one. Um, and, and then all the sort of social trends that come with population aging. So a, a much bigger growth of, of people who might be um, carers at different stages of life or sandwich carers and so on. Um, and of course, this changing health trend that actually, while life expectancy has continued to grow, um, health expectancy is, is falling in many places. Um, so the, the kind of overall findings were that, that actually lots, so about one in three, 4.3 million uh, Gen Xs overall are set to reach retirement with, with minimal retirement incomes. Uh, which is a massive number and, and we have this sort of pretty short window of opportunity now really in the next sort of 10 15 years before before these people retire to, to intervene um, and lots of people you can see here on the sort of graph on the side um, saying that they just simply can't afford to um, you know to, to save more lots of people have other kind of costs that they need to continue to um, pay off but also um, sort of things that are taking up time and, and sort of you know, thinking space around this. So, for example, per, you know, health needs themselves or having to care for a family member or children. Um, when we looked at sort of the impact of COVID-19, um, it had a big impact on, on lots of people's ability to save, but actually, interestingly, um, seemed to have an impact as well on how seriously people took it. And actually, people felt kind of a little bit shaken up by it to say, okay, the second I do earn again, or once I come off furlough, um, I'm keen to save more. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of people who said they couldn't save as much as they wanted. Um, and Sue, you mentioned the um, you know, the new gender pension gap stats that have come out uh, yesterday. Um, we looked a little bit at the difference um, of, of sort of what Gen X women were experiencing in our work as well, um, and saw that actually these issues are definitely sort of accentuated by gender. Um, one in six women in this generation said they had no pension savings at all. Um, the majority said they would like to save more, but really couldn't. Um, and a lot of people were really, really worried. And I guess, you know, if we then start looking into the factors, and we'll see this in all sorts of other groups as, as well, is that historically um, women have been much more likely to work part time than their male counterparts, um, have lower incomes, are more likely to have taken a career break um, after having a child, and also the main providers of care when it comes to adults or, or older adults. Um, so what can we do? And I think these recommendations aren't necessarily just for Generation X, but looking kind of to the future of what, you know, what the affordability challenge is going to be uh, for future generations. Um, so so one, um, one thing is clearly around care and that that's just going to be more and more of a facet of all of our lives and all of our working lives. Um, so requiring employers to actually make jobs flexible by default from the start, um, which could you know, allow much more people to, to work who can't um, necessarily um, from the start commit to a completely non-flexible role. Um, there's been lots of recommendations clearly around carers leave and, and making sure people have um, 10 days of pay, paid leave a year. Um, a big issue as well around extending um, auto enrollment to, to people who don't currently qualify. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll come into this in the, in the discussion a little bit, but there have been uh, proposals of so-called sort of sidecar saving schemes so that you can save into something where actually, if you're not sure that you might need the money, you can take it back, but it, but it does start building up a bit of a pot. Um, another thing is um, 
you know, while while PensionWise offers um, offers free free appointments to everyone at age fifty, lots of people don't even don't know about it or don't take them up. Um, so defaulting people into an appointment might be a good point, um, you know, before they're set to retire to to really start um, getting to grips a little bit with with what they can do and how they can make their pension pot bigger and last for longer. Um, and I think one area we we think there's quite a lot of potential in as well as seeing actually how we can expand expand the role of employers really and in getting involved in sort of financial education and literacy um so yeah that that was all from me great thank you very much indeed Leah. Uh, and last but not least we have uh, Sir, Sir steve webb who is faces the difficult task if not impossible uh, of kind of drawing together some of these themes from these very very different um different presentations. Uh, Steve, Steve doesn't really need an introduction. He's currently a partner at LCP. He was previously a pensions minister and he's done loads of pension stuff in between. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Sue, so, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, after so many uh, meaty contributions, I guess I'm the I'm the cherry on the cake or something like that. I don't know. But um, just a few quick thoughts, and I'll touch on three things. One is the state pension and state pension age, following on from John. Uh, a bit on uh, public service pensions, following on from Owen. Uh, and then a thought really slightly linking back to what Leah said about uh, later life, managing a pot of money and so on. So I think on the state pension, I mean, I think it was absolutely right not to accelerate state pension age increases in the light of pre-pandemic changes. So it's tempting to think it was COVID what done it. And as John pointed out, the, at the time of John's report based on 2014 projections, we thought life expectancy at retirement was going to improve. By 2018, life expectancy at retirement had dropped by two years compared with when John did his report. So in four years, it had dropped by nearly two. That's just staggering. So the idea that the government would have said, oh, well, you know, blow that, we're just going to crack on, even without the pandemic, would have been untenable. So I think it was absolutely right they pressed pause. Um, as John says, we don't, of course, know yet what the impact of the pandemic is, whether it was a one-off hit. But I think there is a growing body of evidence. My colleagues in our health analytics department here at LCP have produced some pretty compelling evidence already that this is going to have a lasting impact, uh, for example, on things like uh, lack of early diagnosis. So people are being picked up later with mm -hmm. cancer, with diabetes, pressures on the NHS and so on and so on. And it just does look as though we're going to take a long term hit to longevity partly because of the pandemic and partly because of some of the longer term trends. So I think on that basis, even the 68 in 2046 that's in statute starts to look questionable, in my view, which might be controversial to say in a, a debate about, oh, my God, we're all getting old. How on earth are we going to afford it? But actually, I think it's far, far more nuanced than that. What I didn't agree with in Lucy Neville Rolf's report is the sort of slightly throwaway suggestion that we just have a cap of 6% of national income on the state pension. I think that was the figure, but you know, a set, a set cap, which is just, I mean, I suspect that, you know, it kind of treasury were quite chuffed to see that thrown in there and nobody really noticed at the time, but that would be utterly inflexible. I mean, on the one hand, John's saying quite rightly, if we have to put pension ages up, let's do one year every 10, let's do it gradually. If you just said 6% of national income, well, once you've hit it, you're suddenly having to do some pretty drastic things to keep within 6%. You have to hike the pension aid, scrap the triple lock, probably scrap the double lock. You know, that's a, a ridiculously rigid thing. I mean, even done on a five year re review with a glide path, that would be utterly brutal. And, it, you know, if we have a pressure of an aging population, we need to look at it in the round, not pick one bit of the system and throw all the pain at that one bit of the system. So I really didn't like that. Um, Owen and his colleagues do a great job in their five yearly review of the National Insurance Fund, but they are asked an utterly stupid question. So just, just for the avoidance of doubt, I have the highest respect for Owen and his colleagues. They do a grand job as answering a completely stupid question, which is how does the amount we spend on the state pension compare with revenue from one of the taxes we use to fund the welfare state, i.e. national insurance? Well, National insurance rates change for all sorts of reasons. You know, the Chancellor might cut NI because there's an election next year, utterly unconnected to future spending on the state pension. And we all know that if the NI fund, quotes, ran out of money, they just bung some money in. I mean, that is literally what they do. When the money's short, they just find some money from tax. So the balance between the state pension cost and the balance of the NI fund is one of the least interesting numbers in the whole of public policy. And why Owen and his colleagues are forced to answer this stupid question, I have no idea. 
Um, just briefly on public service pensions, and again, Owen mentioned these, I was asked to sort of talk a bit about the sustainability of those. Very short answer, this isn't where the excitement really lies. As John said, the real pressure of an aging population actually isn't in pensions at all, it's in health. It's in health and social care. Those numbers make the pension numbers look quite modest. Public service pensions as a share of GDP are projected to fall. So the idea that after 10 years of turmoil in public sector pensions, reform, McLeod, scape discount rates, changing pension ages, career average, increased contribution rates, we now sit down and say, do you know what we ought to do? We ought to reform public sector pensions. Just leave them alone. Just leave them alone for 10 years. That's not where the spending pressure is. It's not where the sustainability pressure is. And I just think a period of stability would be very welcome. Last thought, just on the individual level, and Leia touched on this a bit, is, you know, we do have this DC generation at retirement, lots of freedom, lots of flexibilities, quite modest parts, people cashing them out and so on. But my big concern is later retirement. So fine, freedom and choice, early phase retirement, great. But when I get to 80, do I want to be managing an investment pot? Do I want to be guessing if I'll live four years or eight years or 12 years? You know, the risk is I get that wrong and I either under consume, which is what most pensioners do. You know, I'm worried I'll run out. So I take it too slowly and then have a miserable later years of my life and leave money to the kids. Or do I over consume and risk running out, which obviously we don't want to see either. So I think annuities have a key role to play, not at 65, which is why pension freedoms are important in my mm -hmm. view, but let's say at 80. However, crucial point, we can't go around trying to flog annuities to 80 year olds. We have to bake that in at 65. We have to have a journey of retirement, what we call flex first, fix later. That idea that at retirement, when there's advice and guidance and all of that, you lock into a product that will start with that flex phase, allow you to draw down, take a bit of cash for something you want, but have a journey towards an annuity. You can opt out, that's fine but the default journey towards an annuity will help to deal with the individual who faces this massive longevity uncertainty. You know, the system has uncertainty, but the individual has huge uncertainty. So let's have a set of defaults that help the individual. Let's have a sustainable state pension system that pays at reasonable ages, which I think shouldn't accelerate. Um, and let's not get distracted by public service pensions. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Steve. I'm quite relieved what you said about public service pensions being the lucky recipient of one, <laughs> though it's not quite as much money as people think it is. Um, great. OK, let's move on to questions. So I have. I have some I'm going to be juggling between the Q&A and chat, so do bear, do bear with me. I'm going to go through the um, the ones in the Q&A first. So um, I think this is a question for, for John probably in his study. To what extent has any increase of state pension age been supplanted by increase in those on incapacity and out of work benefits, maybe due to the pandemic? So, so the state pension age has increased, but are people getting other benefits because they can't work, I think is, is the question. Can I bring you in on that one, John? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Sue. Well, I think the question is absolutely right. And it comes back to the point that whilst I concluded that there was great merit in having a single state pension age, a universal system, a basic right, and the, I couldn't find a system of differential ages by geography or differential ages by occupational education. It collapsed under its own complexity. The reality, nonetheless, with a single state pension age is that some people are badly disadvantaged and they're usually people who've been badly disadvantaged throughout their lives, starting with education, often with health, often with employability. And frankly, they're not likely to be working and earning significant income in their 40s and 50s, never mind in their 60s. So the idea that they can wait later for their pension isn't viable. The reality is that for those most disadvantaged and dependent on the benefit system at the moment, they're much better off when they become a state pensioner, even if, as Leia says, they have no other personal pension they'll still be better off as a state pensioner than they are 
as a recipient and a dependent of the benefit system. So those people, as the questioner uh, identifies, will be badly affected by increases in the state pension age. And I, in my own report, concluded that we needed to use, would need in the future, as the state pension age increased, to use means-tested benefits before the state pension age. So those of us able to continue working would have to wait longer for our state pension, but those who are in the category I've already described and the pensioner and the questioner is referring to would get a means-tested benefit from the benefit system before their state pension age, so that when they were not uniquely disadvantaged. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that question? I can't actually see the other participants, so I'm not I think you'll just have to speak. No, I'll, I'll take silence as not at the moment, thanks. Um, so this second question is, is in a way related, it's sort of the flip side, which is the attitude of employers towards older workers. So even those who are fit and able to work can't because there is prejudice against them. Again, I think that's probably something for you to answer, John, if you could. Well, I don't want to hog the floor, but clearly this is a huge issue. I already alluded, and I won't repeat myself in the interest of time, I think we need to redesign job roles for older workers, focus more on what they know and can pass back to younger colleagues than expecting them to continue to do that hard-breaking teaching, nursing, manufacturing work. There's a very good reason why you won't see anybody over the age of 60 in a car plant. It's just a reality of life. Um, I also think we need, as, as uh, Lily referred to, we need much more flexible job contracts so that people can work part time, can work around their caring and other responsibilities and their own capacity to work. And what's the evidence of employer response? Well, it's quite low at the moment. I think the reality is it's taken employers a generation to wake up to the needs of working mums and an increasing but still small proportion of working dads needing flexibility. There's going to need to be an eye-opener moment, a, a, a Saul on the road to Damascus moment for employers to wake up to the fact that this is just as much an issue for older people and particularly because of their caring responsibilities. It'll come, I hope it'll be by best practice and sharing of best practice, but it needs to come. What I think the evidence does show is there's less discrimination against older workers than there used to be, partly because of cultural change, partly because of legislative protections. But I think the last time I looked at it, Sue, the evidence was that whilst there was less evidence of people being discriminated against in work because they were older, that is still happening, but to a lesser extent, it's still very hard to get a job if you're an older worker trying to re-enter the labour market. And that's particularly relevant to people who might need to step out of the labour market completely in their late 50s for five years to look after an aged parent, but then because of their income, need to start working again, let's say at the age of 63. Yes, and apart from B&Q, there aren't, um, and a few other shining examples, it, it is, um, I agree quite difficult. I'm going to take the spotlight off you now, John, you'll be glad to hear. Um, so another question is that Leia made reference to CDC as a means of providing retirement income predictability, uh, and the government seems to be a fan of this. What, what does the panel think? And um, well, let's go to Steve first for that one. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sue. Yes, it seems to me that CDC should be part of the landscape. Uh, it's taken a long time to come. So Royal Mail is, is nearly there, but still not quite. Uh, we have clients who are interested in multi-employer CDC. So mm. rather than just the Royal Mail do it, you'd be able to join one that spans your industry or uh, something like a master trust, that kind of arrangement. So anybody, any firm could, could be part of it. Because um, I think, you know, I always say one of my rules of politics is that pendulums never stop in the middle. You know, we went from DB where all the risk was on the employer to DC, whereas uh, we were hearing earlier, all the risks on the individual. And it's not obvious that either extreme is the best outcome. So some pooling of risk, some pooling of returns between generations, between members of the scheme seems to me to be a good thing. Um, I think the interesting question, I think, is coming in the Q&A is about post-retirement. 
So, you know, it's one thing starting at 20 as a postie and, you know, in 50 years time, you'll get your CDC pension. But what about those of us who are coming up to retirement, maybe with a DC pot, which we've built up on our own, could we be start of something collective post-retirement? And I think we could because post-retirement is potentially a quarter of a century on average. So there's no particular reason why we couldn't have post-retirement CDC, Nest or somebody could run that, could be done commercially. And I think that would overcome the longevity issue for the individual because in, in post-retirement CDC, the payout lasts as long as you do. So you haven't bought an annuity, but you're part of a pool, yeah. you know, and, and that feels to me like quite a good option. I don't think it's right for everybody, uh, you know, but I would like to see that progress, certainly. Uh, Leia, would you like to also comment on the same question as it references your talk? Uh, yes, yeah, and I, I mean, agree with what Steve was saying, and I think CDC, you know, certainly in theory, sounds like a great solution and sort of, you know, halfway house. I think the, the key challenge is to make it work in, in practice. And so I think perhaps bigger multi-employer schemes could be the way to go because really CDC works, you know, best if you kind of join and then you stay in it, you know, until you die. Um, given that that doesn't necessarily happen to most people, having something that's more flexible if you change jobs, etc., cetera, um, I think would work better. Um, and then, yeah, as he said, you know, post, post retirement, it could be a really good way of just addressing that uh, longevity risk challenge that I was talking about before. Um, but again, what's really important to make it work is to get that communication to members, right, so that people know what they're letting themselves in for. And for example, you know, with the longevity pooling, um, there will be winners and there will be losers and there will be some people who join and then they will die early and if they'd kept their money in a DC pot that money would have gone to their families so making sure people understand that understand um, you know how benefits might change in future understand that they're you know whether they're locked in or how they could exit that's all really really important it's not it's not that easy to understand and in order to make it successful I think the broader and bigger you can make it um, the better but also just make sure that it can be explained in a relatively simple way so that people really understand the risks. Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Indy. As an aside, about a million years ago, I remember listening to a budget rep from the Plymouth Brethren who explained why what was near compulsory annuitization didn't was against their religion because you know, they somebody benefited at, at the expense of somebody else. And that was quite instrumental in evolving the policy towards uh, towards pension freedoms. Sorry, that's a bit of a bit of an aside, but it, it was it was it was interesting at the time. Maybe you had to be there. Um, let's move on to a different question. And, and maybe I can direct this one at Owen as it's about um, taxation. So should there be even more discussion in this debate of taxation as the other side of the coin, as it were, in the affordability discussion? Thanks. Sue. Well, in relation to the to the public service pension schemes, um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, that valuations are undertaken to these schemes to to, to determine the employer contribution rate and um, determine um, an appropriate charge um, to place on employers, um, and those are determined with reference to uh, long term GDP expectations. Um, so, to the extent that um, uh, long-term G expectations have fallen and therefore you might expect tax revenue to fall, a higher charge is recognised now on um, participants of the uh, public service pension schemes. So I think that, yeah, I think it does feature within the affordability discussion from, from that um, from that perspective. I wonder if the questioner is also talking about uh, tax relief on pensions. Maybe that's uh, which is is quite substantial. That no, that's not something in your area of expertise necessarily, I guess. Well, um, it, it, it's of course been something that's been in the press um, quite a lot in, in in recent years about the 
the the balance of, of who is taxed at what point uh, they they are taxed um, and the extent to um, the amount of um, the the tax relief. I, I think all I say is there's, there's a delicate balance about using tax relief to um, encourage pension saving, which is which is a, a large part of it, but um, also um, encouraging the right amount for, for for the right people and not being disproportionate in in doing so. But um, other, mem other members of the, the panel may have more to add there. Uh, Steve, flat rate pensions tax relief. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think we could use the money we spend on pension tax relief much more effectively, but probably by having a, a separate regime for DB and DC. And in DC, once you once you have a DC regime, you don't need to link the tax relief to marginal rate at all. Uh, but in fact, flat rate doesn't go far enough for me. You know, we know that there are people who are under saving. And if you give low earners tax relief at, you know, 28% or 30% instead of 20%, well, that's kind of nice, but it makes pretty little difference because they're just not putting enough money in. So what I think we need on the DC side is matching for low earners. So, you know, the first thousand pounds you put in a pension, the government puts a thousand pounds in. And the next thousand pounds you put in, the government puts 500 in. And after that, it puts in 150 per thousand or whatever, you know, something really, really loaded towards low earners, because those are the people who are saving catastrophically low amounts of money into DC pensions. And flat rate relief, you know, yes, takes some money off high earners and spreads it very thinly across tens of millions of people, but doesn't really achieve a lot, massively complexifies the system. So I'd say let's have a DB system where, you know, you decide what the level of generosity you want for DB pensions is. Which is essentially public sector in future that you know so it's yeah. it's all linked into public sector and then let's have a simple and what i like about matching is actually you can find language coming back to sue your point yeah. about communications yeah. you know you put a thousand in the government put a thousand in great i get that martin lewis can go on the telly and say do you know what you know you can double your money you won't get that on bitcoin you, you know you can you can talk simply about it marginal rate tax relief and lifetime allowance and money purchase annual allowance for the birds really yeah, uh, so something much more progressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I've just had a little message from something that I've reminded me, something I forgot to do earlier, which is to bring in David Sinclair, who is the CEO of the ILC and therefore our host. So, um, David. Th th thanks, Sue. And I perhaps just I'm really to sorry of... about that. No, no, that's fine. That's that's fine. Um, and, and certainly really interesting things. And, and I should say, I also are proud at pushing on the value of annuities, even when everyone else said they were rubbish. We were always really keen on the fact that, you know, there isn't another way. You know, it's one of the best ways of managing longevity risk. And where we are at the moment is we've passed responsibility to consumers to manage their own longevity risk. And we're selling people pension investments, not pensions. And I think there's a real challenge there that we need to recognise. And certainly agree with Steve as well that the real costs for government are health. You know, it's almost impossible to manage demand in health because you have a new innovation and you can't tell people you're not going to have it but I just wanted to sort of just for two minutes is sort of reflect back to the sort of the relationship between work and pensions because a couple of weeks ago we launched a new global pensions index called the health sorry a global healthy aging and prevention index which ties together life expectancy and healthy life expectancy and income and environment so, uh, you know, and what does it show? Well, it shows across the EU, we work 28 years of our lives between the age of 15 and 65. So 28 years, 28 years. Let's say we're talking about the 100 year life. 28 years is not a lot. Scandinavian countries work about 31 years. Um, APEC and Asian countries, 33 years. So EU workers, despite sort of the protests, work fewer workers than uh, years than pretty much any other economic bloc across the world. And from an entirely practical point of view, it seems unlikely to me that governments can, you know, and, and I say EU, you know, but I'm saying EU, making the UK a nominal member of the EU because it doesn't change the figures very much. Um, you know, it seems unlikely that governments can sustain decent pensions based on 28 years of of work when we're living into our into our 80s so so what and but equally it seems unlikely that we ourselves <laughs> can save privately for retirement based on 28 years at years of work 
But actually what that doesn't mean is we all have to be working to 70 or 75 or whatever. I think what that means is how do you get the European Union, EU, UK to increase the number of years we're working to the level of Scandinavian countries? That's three years. Um, so we're talking about increasing the average retirement age as opposed to the average state pension age or the average number of years we work as opposed to the to the average state pension age. So for some people, that means working to 53 instead of 50. For others, it means working to 73 instead of 70. And we know that if we work for three more years during our lives, we draw our pensions longer. So we have fewer years to make the pension pot last. We save for three years longer and we earn more for three years. So there's triple benefit of this um so, so so you know just you know so the relationship between work and pension is extraordinarily important here and all re work and retirement income extraordinarily important then so, you know how how do we do it and you know, certainly take on board all the points made so far i think what we know from our analysis is people who are healthier work longer they spend more they volunteer more and they care more and the ages and question is really interesting because actually there are four 1.4 million people who leave the workforce early still the big driver of that is health and uh, ill health and care massive the biggest biggest issues we have to have to face so 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 what do we do and let me just dump some sort of ideas just to finish one um we have to invest in health and prevention and care we think government should be spending six percent of their health budgets on prevention it's completely doable canada does it. it should be absolutely possible we need more midlife health interventions we're obsessed with getting teenagers to do physical activity when they're pretty much the only group who gets close to their 150 minutes there's very little for people midlife and beyond we need more on active travel. It's the one thing in adulthood we know keeps us keeps us active. We need more nanny state. Even Gordon Os George Osborne now agrees with this. We need to increase the smoking age um, one year by year and, and be really, really focused on stopping things that are bad for us. So we need an industrial strategy focused on demand. So how can our economy create the jobs that people want to do? And, and finally, so we need fewer of what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs. And I think AI can help. I think AI can get rid of some of these crap jobs that no one wants to do into their 50s and 60s and replace them with jobs that people really, really want to do. And as part of that, I think a Green New Deal is an ageing society New Deal. So I think a, a, a direction from government on delivering this sort of new industrial strategy, recognising the, the, the need to create really good jobs whilst also keeping us healthy is absolutely core to, core to this agenda. So, but, you know, so, so I'm going to stop there. But I think so much in this and and i think tying together the work and the pension stuff is, is extraordinarily important thank you very much david yes no, no coincidence it's in one department i guess um i'm going to go back to some of the q a now there are a couple a couple on the triple lock one sort of suggesting it's a bit bonkers and unsustainable and the other one saying is it correct to say the main beneficiaries are not the poorest pensioners. I think that's probably one for you, Steve. Oh, go on then. <laughs> and you'd um, like that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it's important to not think that the way things are now is the way things are always going to be. You know, the IFS will tell us pensioners have never had it so good, and on average, pensioners are better off than workers once you adjust for housing costs and so on. But the future doesn't look like that, as we've heard. The DC generation is going to have inadequate pensions, and women on average will have smaller pensions than men. So when you project future pension incomes, the state pension is, I forget the exact figure, but three quarters of the income of the average woman at retirement. It's incredibly important important to women in particular, but to lower income people in retirement in general. And so if we switch off the triple lock, all we're saying is that we will increase gender pension inequality because it's far more important to women than to men. Um, and we'll leave more people, you know, because people are going to have more DC pensions just because we switch off the triple lock. They'll just retire poorer and we are under saving. So I think if we get to a stage where we're all saving a good whack into our DC pensions and maybe topped up with matching and all the rest of it, and we're, you know, then at that point, we might well say, well, we've gone too far on the state pension or let's ease off on the state pension. But my view is that the, the triple lock provides that foundation that gets people clear of means testing by and large, which has got to be a good thing because the questioner who says, well, triple lock doesn't help the poorest pensioners. Well, 
what it does is it makes sure they have a state pension that's enough to live on at a basic level. So they don't have to claim means tested top ups, which we know lots of people don't. So short answer, there will come a point when you have to switch the triple lock off when we've got a state pension worth the name. But it is still pretty modest. It's still not a level that any of us on this video call would want to live on. And so I think, you know, it's a it's a clumsy ratchet, but it works politically to get the pension up to a, to a more decent level. And that's why it's been effective for the last 10 years or so. And our, pen, our state pension remains one of the lowest in Europe. Yeah, I think. exactly. Yeah. So um, there's a long way to go on that one. Thank you. There's a sort can of I, so, Sue, can I just come in on that? Just yes, very, of course very clearly. Just David. also, I'm add. really sorry. I, I can't. No, see no, sorry. I, I think the other, the other sort of con context of this is prior to you know and having you know prior to the introduction of 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 pension credit it was pretty much inevitable that older people were more likely to be poor than people than, than younger people it was pretty inevitable you know what i i think we should be looking at a success success that we've actually created public policy that means that is not the case anymore and rather than all of a sudden saying well actually older people are better off we should stop this it, i think we've got to really really think about actually that you know, see, see the 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 last twenty years has actually been in a good place, but we're now in a really difficult place because you know, with the end of the DB pensions means we're going to see pension poverty starting to increase again. So, so there is the thing for me is actually how do we build whilst maintaining intergenerational fairness on the successes we've had over the last sort of fifteen or twenty years? Yeah, th thank thanks very much, David. Um, there's a, a sort of related, well, it's not quite related. I'm going to bring John in on this one, I think. Should there be as much or more focus on public private divide inequality as on the male female inequality? John, what do you think? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, as several speakers have alluded to, Steve, most recently, there's still a lot to do to help um, women who have been disadvantaged in earnings throughout their working life and often with pensions. We have made some progress, but we have nowhere made enough progress. So I wouldn't want to lose that emphasis. On public, private, I was particularly interested by Steve's comments that at the moment he doesn't see the public sector pensions as, as the big ticket issue compared to the other big ticket mm -hmm. issues address and I, I find what Steve said there persuasive. I mean it, it is a fact and I think um, Leah and Lily really put their finger on this that the next generation of people working in the private sector particularly in frontline jobs in hospitality in retail where turnover is high, labour turnover is high, where earnings are low and where pension support, unionisation is low, pension support is patchy. Those people are going to face real stresses and strains that I fully appreciate and for the avoidance of doubt that public sector pensions are not going to be what they were where we've moved to DC provision for people in public sector jobs. But some of the people I've just described, living wage employees in their 40s and 50s who've never got off that bottom of the income bracket, moving rapidly between lots of employers on the high street or in leisure and hospitality, I think those people are going to find it really stressful. And they are the people who are going to have very little other than the state pension to live on. So I, I, I'd want to avoid the Robin Peter to pay Paul, focusing on one group as against another group. But I do think we need to put the spotlight on those who are most disadvantaged. I think um, my two groups actually overlap because a lot mm -hmm. of those low paid uh, workers in consumer services are part-time working women. And I think let's focus on those who need the most help. Great, thanks very much. Um, stay with me because I think you might have a view on, on this one as well. Interesting question. Uh, so given the uncertainty about longevity, 
is there a case for bringing back the issuance of undated gilts, which individual pensioners could buy, insurance providers could buy, could use to buy back their own pension promises? Um, I'll defer that one perhaps to Steve. I'm not okay. an expert in that area, so I won't claim to be so. Okay, thanks, John. Steve, interesting yes. question. I'm inclined to say thanks, John, as well. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm always a little bit sceptical that there's somehow, I mean, obviously Norma, who's asked the questions, is, is very expert and very well informed. I, I'm just always sceptical that some wheeze that somehow, you know, saves the government money, helps everybody plan their retirement. I mean, I kind of think if it was as easy as that, they'd have done it by now. OK, short and sweet. Thank you very much. Um, there's a slightly cynical question here that the debate around the state pension age focuses on what's best for the treasury public finances with less consideration about what's best for older people. Um, so in, in a way, this is the health question, isn't it? Sort of, it's another variation on it. What are the panel's perspectives on the significance of reform to adult social care? And Steve, I'm gonna come back to you with that one, I think. And I as I say, I think this is a variation on the health health issue. Yeah, I mean, ad adult social care seems to be one of those things that just keeps being kicked down the path, isn't it? It, it? You know, people sometimes say, oh, what we need for pensions is a is a, a Royal Commission or a, a non-party group because the Turner Commission was so good, and it was. But social care is the counterexample where we've had Royal Commission, you know, we had a Royal Commission in 1990, a quarter of a century ago late 90s we had Andrew Dillnot's work we had legislation for it and we just you know it looks though like it's going to be deferred yeah. yet again uh, and it is it is utterly shocking I mean um, I think the the big issue for me is that some of us will have negligible care costs and some of us will face a fortune and none of us know who it's going to be so for me this isn't a savings issue this isn't that we should all put a bit aside just in case we have care costs in later life because you could you know waste money that you didn't need or you could be just you know run out within three months in a care home kind of thing so for me there has to be a collective solution to that I don't much care if it's collective state insurance private insurance some mix of the two um, but basically you know given the figures I think that Owen mentioned earlier about the over 85s and John you know this is going to be us and at the moment, it's been a Cinderella, but it's going to be more and more of a mainstream issue. And the children of that generation will experience it more. So I think it is going up the, the political agenda. It's, it's never quite got to the top because it's complicated and no one wants to think about it. But when it's your parents or it's you, then it's really painful. And I think, I think generationally, it will go up the political agenda and there'll be more pressure for solutions. But sadly, it's never quite got there until now. Yeah, so thank you. Do you mind if I come in on that as well quickly? Yes, of course. Thank you, um, Lily. Sorry, please um, shout out yeah. fellow panellists because uh, I can't see you. <laughs> no, and, and completely agree on Steve's point. And I guess the issue is you both have this massive extra risk placed on individuals and that big concern of how much and if you can have to you know save for potential care costs but also all the other impacts on the economy so um we're we're just sort of finishing off some work looking at kind of spending and underspending and a big big barrier is people's you know inability to really forecast what they're going to need so it you know it's impacting the wider economy in terms of people's spendings clearly it's impacting the economy massively in terms of um people falling out of the workforce when they're caring so i think the you know there's the the risk on the individual but clearly the massive economic risk for for the whole country and, and yeah and I, I so i think the other thing i'd just add to that um and do look out for that report because i think it'd be really useful in the next few weeks um is that um what we know is you know, care as long as, as well as health as, as i said earlier are the two big reasons why people um stop working early so actually part of the solution is also sorting childcare. frankly you know actually i suspect you know the the relationship between making sure we get childcare right and keeping people of all ages in work is extraordinarily important and i i think that it, it's absolutely key that we don't forget about that Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm now moving to some of the earlier questions that haven't been answered, but that came in when people registered. Uh, and the first one, so 
talking about post-retirement, does flexi-axis drawdown need to be restricted to avoid people running out of money? And I think that's another one. For, sorry, Steve, I think that's another one for you. <laughs> No, I saw that question. And I mean, I, I, my answer would be no, I don't think so, because the evidence is that, you know, it, obviously it was joked that people would use their money on a sports car. But of course, the generation who saved and have a pot of money at retirement today voluntarily saved by and large, you know, the savings wasn't mandatory on the whole. Uh, they were frugal people, they were savers, they were that generation who don't just go mad with a pot of money, who don't spend it all and then claim housing benefits and stuff. That's not, that's not that generation. So I think there is very little evidence that people are overspending willfully you know because there's a welfare state to catch them it, it, it just that's not what's happening they are underspending if anything i think uh now all right it's their free choice if their priority is leaving money for the kids but if they're just underspending because they're afraid they'll run out of money then that's not what we want you know we actually want them to be able to spend at a sustainable rate and to enjoy the money they've saved and that's again where i think this kind of hybrid post-retirement product the drawdown first the making the most of the modest point you've got and then the annuity later so that you know you won't run out of money in that later phase because you'll have annuitized but you have that flexibility and a bit of extra investment growth in the earlier phase and so rather than you know undo pension freedoms i think i would I'd, I'd bake in the annuity later on i mean david's point about ilc being fans of annuity i'm a fan of annuity just not at 65 and i think you know they have a role but we were probably buying them a bit too soon Great, thank you. And, thank you and very so much. If, if I could just add to that. Um, yes, so, yes, I mean, I agree with, with Steve. I also wouldn't want to uh, limit, uh, place any mandatory limits on, on drawdown um, because actually it's just so dependent on the individual. And for some people, it may make sense to draw down a lot uh, to start with because of their other financial commitments. For example, if they've still got outstanding mortgage debt or, you know, depending on their health or, or whatever, or indeed, if they haven't got enough to buy an annuity anyway, they may be better off spending that initially. So there are a multitude of reasons why it may be better for people to draw down more quickly. And as Steve said, in many cases, people aren't probably aren't doing that. I think... Uh, rather than setting rules around things like drawdown, um, what needs to happen is provide more more education and advice and guidance. And, and I think Lily mentioned pensions wise, um, and we, we did some research um, as well, um, you know, people kind of over the age of 55. And um, so many of them don't understand their pensions products and so many of them don't understand how to access it and so many of them don't take advice so you know providing more education perhaps mandatory appointments with with pensions wise or more access to advice that's you know i think that's the the, the key point because actually what you do with the money should be so specifically tailored to your individual circumstances, how much money you have and what you need. Uh, you can't set walls around, you know, that's the benefit of pension freedoms, but people don't know how to use those freedoms and they need more help with that. Yeah, they, they, they do need more help. Um, sorry to interject <laughs> in my own opinion. I mean, some of the issue with pensions freedom is a lot of people had tiny pots. I mean, it was trivial commutation. So they, they took out the whole lot because that just made sense for them. I think this whole advice guidance thing, guidance thing is a bit of a minefield because most people won't have enough money to take regulated advice and pension wise, they really want to be told what to do and pension wise can't do that. It can't get over that regulatory boundary. So I think this is this is one of the key issues. So I think financial education is, is not sufficient. I'd also say the ind pensions are actually pretty simple, but the industry doesn't explain them clearly enough because there's no advantage in doing that. It's much better to make it all very dark and mysterious. Anyway, that's my hobby horse. So as we come to the closing few minutes, what I'm going to do is invite each panelist to give us final uh, reflections on what we've heard and one thing that would make a difference. So a couple of minutes each. I'm going to go in the order you appear on my screen, which is Lily, John, Owen, Leah, Steve, David. Lily. Great. I'll be very quick um, and just follow on from, from this final point, really. I think we haven't touched on it 
perhaps enough, but is around financial literacy, advice, guidance, and, and just opening access to that. Um, John, thank you, John. Thank you. I really piggyback on the back of Lily's comment. I would only add that I think financial choices are a consequence of lifestyle choices. And another of the mistakes we make is we see this as a financial services industry and therefore we should be advising and sometimes selling a financial product. But actually it's about lifestyle choices. How long people need to work, how long people want to work, what level of income they need, all those things are consequences of what they want to do with the remaining part of their life. Some people don't have a lot of choice because of health problems. Some people don't have a lot of choice because they need to spend more time in a caring role. Some people want to volunteer. They want to make a contribution to society that isn't income earning, but is still hugely valuable to the national well-being. So all I'd say at the risk of repetition is these financial questions are hugely important, but they are consequences of a primary choice, which is about lifestyle. We spend an awful lot of time with young people on what we call careers advice. I'm not sure we've ever got it right, but we're actually asking people what they want to do with their lives, not what they want to earn. Perhaps that's what we need to do with people in their 50s as well. Great. Thanks very much. Owen, any final reflections? Yeah, I, I, I've touched on slightly today, but I, I think that, that over the last few years, it's become more and more apparent that there really is um, a, a kind of widening disparity in life expectancy within. The, the country, whether that's based on uh, geographical location, although that's really only a proxy for, for underlying um, reasons uh, such as level of deprivation, socioeconomic uh, status, etc. So uh, I think that there's definitely a case for a focus being on um, um, not just a one-size-fits-all approach to pensions, but really targeting people's different, um, different situations and, and expectations. Thank you. Leah? Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, I think what is important is that, you know, as a minimum, we continue to have a, you know, a, a minimum level of, of, of benefits, retirement income through the state pension and, and benefits that, you know, does provide that safety net and, you know, set that at a level that people can live in, in, in dignity in retirement um, and, you know, setting the not increasing the state pension age too much to allow for some of those factors of inequality and differences in life expectancy, for example, is important. And, and taking that considered view, but having that basic um, level at a at a level that you know does work for people, I think is important. And then on top of that, I think there is then a bigger decision about you know what what can and should we reasonably expect in retirement, how much of that responsibility do we place on individuals and how much of that do we think it should be funded by um by, by you know the, the state or or employers and you know obviously that then needs to be compared to to other priorities but if there's a basic level of safety then we can have a more you know sensible policy debate about the rest uh, what i would say is that unless you know something happens in terms of so new products for you know the post retirement stage better education around adequacy um but you know more support for people to save into pensions we will most likely end up with people retiring at a level of income much much below what they would expect or want and potentially at a level that doesn't support you know a sensible minimum standard thanks steve I think there's a golden thread that unlocks this problem that ties together what David was saying about the link between work and pensions and slightly touches on some of the other comments about health, which is if we can focus our resources on stopping 53 year olds going off sick, ending up on early retirement sickness benefits and possibly being on state pensions and disability benefits for 30 years in, or 20 years in retirement, that completely changes the fiscal position. 
I mean, obviously it changes the individual's life as well, but you know, the difference between someone who works on healthily in their 50s and 60s, they build up more pension, they can support themselves in retirement, we're not paying out benefits and all of that, as against someone who we fail to catch when, when they've got an early condition or we don't look after them in the workplace. You know, the, the pound spent there has such a phenomenal rate of return that so many of these other pressures that we've been talking about would be so much eased. So I think in many ways, you know, if we can move from a world where the NHS is a sort of importer of sickness to a world where the health system is an exporter of health, that would actually transform the maths and the lives of the individuals concerned. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the lesson I've taken from all this is that sustainability of pensions is not really about pensions <laughs> or a large part of it is, yeah. is not about pensions. But we're getting in here into the sort of the, the core mission of the ILC. So I'll, I'll give David the last word. Yeah, thanks. And I, I, I fasc fascinating discussion. And thanks again to the, to the actuarial profession and for our panellists. Um, I, on, on the accumulation side, Lily talked about how Gen X were really in trouble. Um, probably not as much trouble as millennials. And, and <laughs> so if anyone wants to fund the next bit of work, we're, we're, <laughs> we're ready for that. Um, but but actually the point made earlier by one of the of, in questions about the increasing number of people who are renters. So I think we have to recognize that we have a very long term challenge here around the accumulation side that needs serious work. And that probably needs us, you know, not tinkering with auto enrollment levels, potentially significantly increasing auto enrollment levels beyond, beyond even what the industry is currently suggesting. Um, so on the decumulation side, I think the question for me is where should public policy focus? For me, it actually probably shouldn't be on the someone with a 20 grand DC benefit, uh, pension and not much else, because frankly, how they spend that money won't impact much on their retirement income. Um, you know, they can buy their Lamborghini if they if if they if they want. Um, it's also probably not on someone who's got a big final salary scheme and a DC scheme because frankly you know they they make a mistake with their DC scheme and they probably still got they've still got a DB scheme to, to fall back on the big issue for public policy and the big risk issue and this some work we did after pension freedoms highlighted this is the group in the middle who don't have very much of a DB scheme but potentially have a hundred to two hundred thousand DC where the decisions that they make at retirement will massively impact on the long-term retirement income Income. And, and it seems to me we need to really focus public policy and advice and guidance on, on that group of the population. And within that, we do need to use technology. And our final comment, the reality is that AI, despite what the regulator might like, is absolutely recommending products in this space. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we, we absolutely need to be thinking about how we use technology, how we use robo-advice, and indeed how we use AI to get people the right sort of support before they they end up with the advisor so exciting opportunities but real challenges ahead and we need uh, in all cases to have policy that is much more progressive is the other message i take now i think at this point some slides should some final i want to thank all the speakers very much for that for that uh, for that discussion I think at this stage, there should be a slide that tells you what's happening next. Yeah, upcoming events. So the conclusions from this, the discussion will all feed into the ILC's longevity white paper, uh, which will be launched at the Future of Aging 2023. So do sign up for that. And the next joint webinar is on Wednesday, the 21st of June. There's also a slide about how you can get in touch with the ILC, I think. There you go. Sign up to the ILC's Friday 3 newsletter, which is a really good read. Since I became a trustee and waiting, I've been reading that every week. And any further thoughts or solutions, do please just email at the events email. So thank you so much to everyone for coming. And I'm really sorry if I didn't reach your question, but thank you. And thanks again to the panellists.